Thank you. The final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 13562 in the name of Christina McKelvey on do the human rights thing, keep the human rights act. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members wish to speak in the debate, please press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And can I warn members that I notice that time is extremely tight. So can I call on Christina McKelvey to open the debate? Thank you very much, President Officer. Can I take this opportunity to thank um, all of my colleagues across the Chamber who signed the motion to allow us to debate this very important issue today? And can I thank Amnesty International, SCVO, HRCS, the Reid Foundation, the Scottish Human Rights Commission, and the many other organisations who have helped us with understanding this process and given us um, some uh, input into how they see. Uh, this uh, piece of work shaping up. Presiding officer, the Magna Carta went viral in 12.15. Well, there were 13 copies made, complete with spelling mistakes, though they were blissfully unaware of LOL and the potential for tweeting the document. But the Magna Carta, unlike the Declaration of Arbroath, which enshrined the rights of Scotland's sovereign people, enshrined the rights of the barons of the time. It was, though, still a Bill of Rights in its limited sense. That the Prime Minister was happy to tear it up in its 800th anniversary speaks volubly of his approach to human rights, even those of his barons. He has, of course, displayed something similar in completely failing to recognise the rights of hundreds of thousands of refugees uh, to give them safety across Europe. And I listened to a wee bit of the Westminster debate this afternoon, and I have to say I wasn't um, very much uh, enthralled by it. Presiding officer, while Germany happily absorbs 800,000 people, David Cameron stands back and under pressure says, well, we might make, take a thousand or so from the camps, but we are not taking anyone who has jumped the queue, as one of Nigel Farage's acolytes put it. That arrogant, self -lack, selfish lack of the remotest compassion or even simple empathy for the family of Island Kurdi, as his small three-year-old body was carried out of the sea, brought anger and distress across Europe. Public outcry has been such that even David Cameron, who admits he hasn't a clue about the price of bread, had to back down a bit more than he would have liked. It might even upset some of his backbenchers that he'll have to take some desperate people from the refugee camps. According to David Cameron, King John was outrageous bully, and it was the brave barons that sat him down, gave him a jolly good talking to, and asked him to seal the document. Good on them. We should all stand up to bullies wherever we see them whether that's in the school playground or indeed in the House of Commons. We need to stand together to fight the kind of right-wing extremist messages that are infiltrating our communities and terrifying our towns and cities with their messages of hate and blame. And Amnesty's drive to do the right thing is about exactly this. This campaign to save the Human Rights Act demands that the Westminster government is stopped from bullying the very citizens who put it into power. This is yet another one of those arenas in Scotland where we get a double whammy. We can't decide to hold on to it for ourselves and we can't stop it from being passed by David Cameron's government and so being subjected to the loss of our human rights. We are, in other words, being bullied. On Scot our Scottish Parliament, presiding officer, as you know, has its foundations in human rights legislation, but there seems to be no thought as to the impact on how this place with cognizance of its human rights, formulate, formulates its policy. Something I'm extremely proud of. It's something that's threaded through the Scotland Act and something we should all be extremely proud of. Presiding officer, that is why Amnesty's campaign is so very, very important. Scrapping the Human Rights Act would be a dangerously retrograde step that could put, put us all under threat of tyranny. As Alan Hogarth, head of the advocacy and programmes at Amnesty, succinctly puts it, and I quote, Human rights are not a gift to be bestowed upon us by monarchs, barons or democratically elected politicians even. They are ours to be treasured and protected. It is not up to them to decide who and who is not entitled to human rights. The human part of this is universal. And he continued, if the Prime Minister is sincere about protecting human rights in the UK and is proud of the Magna Carta's legacy, he should stop attack attacking the Human Rights Act and think about he how he can ensure how we all have equal access to justice. Presiding officer, the people spoke out and the Tory government had to listen. As we were preparing for the juggernaut of a bill that would scrap it, suddenly we were being told that there was to be a consultation, not a bill. 
ordinary people refuse to be bullied by this government. But make no mistake, dumping the Human Rights Act and withdrawn completely from ECHR is still a live option. It hasn't gone away. People tend to concentrate on the Human Rights Act importance for refugees, for those who are being tortured, threatened or trafficked. But in fact, its impact reverberates through far more lives than those at the front line of conflict situation. Presiding officer, I give you Jan, an MS sufferer, believed her lack of care support infringed her human rights as an individual. Studying the legislation, she says, helped me to feel stronger, strong enough to search for the support to challenge my local council, and she won not only the additional support, but a sense of her own worth that she had lost over time. Without the act in place, what would have happened to Jan? Do you think she would have managed to get more support? Getting rid of the obligation to treat people as human beings is another handy backdoor way to save money. Welfare reform already includes the erosion of human rights. Can you bear to imagine what might happen if we lacked the ultimate security of the ACHR? Or families, possibly families, stuck in domestic violence? A woman who is stalked and abused by a violent partner surely has the right to be able to escape with her children. That right is enshrined in the Human Rights Act. The Act makes it safe to be gay. That's still illegal and could lead to execution in 78 countries in this world. Thanks in large part to the ECHR and the Human Rights Act in the UK, our rights to be treated as equal, with equal access to protection, regardless of gender, sexuality, race, age, are all protected by law. The struggle for equal rights has been significantly advanced by laws, by campaign groups and by trade unions. The frightening thought that the UK might withdraw from the EU and remove from us protections as crucial as this is yet another solid reason for Scotland to retain its integrity and its compassion by staying in Europe. Scots have always viewed the right to civil liberty as fundamental. Our history in the trade union movement and people such as Keir Cardi is testament to that set of values. Today, presiding officer of the UK Government announced that it will repeal the Human Rights Act and will bring forward a Bill of Rights. So it's time, it's time now. Let us all back Amnesty's Do the Right Thing campaign when enough people speak Governments listen. Thank you. Thank you. Many people want to speak, so can I just advise members that you should take no more than four minutes. Kenny McCaskill, followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Presiding officer, can I thank Christina McKelvey for bringing this? It's an important uh, issue that we have to discuss, especially uh, today. Uh, human rights and the Human Rights Act can bring challenges to governments and other public and indeed private institutions, but that's rightly so. Uh, I myself required to deal with the consequences of the CADR decision, but we accepted it as an administration, albeit that I have to say that we were probably rather begrudging about it. But it's important that we do have the ability for decisions to be challenged and not simply to be put upon people. In every democracy, there requires to be the separation of powers. There requires to be this government that is held to account as the executive by the wider parliament. But equally, there requires to be a legislator to whom you can go uh, if you have queries or indeed feel that either parliament or government are acting beyond or out with their powers or failing to act appropriately. That's how it should be in all democracies. Even the United States, a country that sometimes I and others in this, ch in this chamber would challenge, uh, sees court decisions as fundamental to the defence of the Constitution. And there have been many areas in which the United States has seen the court overturn the legislature and the executive to protect the rights of their citizens. It should be no less in this country, and indeed it has been no less in this country, with people able to go on a variety of reasons or grounds to take issue with actions by government or institutions in the courts. Now, I accept that the Conservatives are being driven not so much by a desire to abolish human rights. They accept uh, uh, the willingness to impose a UK Bill of Rights. It's more their antipathy towards ECHR, to Europe in particular, uh, that sees them driving this forward. But I do believe that a UK Bill of Rights would be no substitute for what is an international institution, what is accepted uh, by almost all right-minded countries, and it would be important that we should remain part of the mainstream, not simply by, by being a member of the European Union, which is a separate political action, but also by subscribing to ECHR and accepting the right of the European Court to hold the government, Scottish or UK, uh, to account. 
This is about the rights of citizens being able to challenge those who are much more powerful or in much more privileged uh, positions. There is a great deal of obsession in the media about crime. That, after all, is one of the things that helps to sell tabloid newspapers, and many of the major challenges that we've faced in Scotland and the UK have been related to criminal justice. And I did myself mention the Cadder uh, issue. But it is much, much wider and broader than that, as Christina McKelvey correctly said. It is about the rights of citizens, whether it's on mental health, whether it's on access uh, to legal aid, whether it's a whole gamut of other aspects. So it is important. Equally, if we were to see the uh, withdrawal from the Human Rights Act, then it does put Scotland in limbo, given its uh, constitutional position in the very founding document of this party. And it would leave the UK isolated along with North Korea and other countries that do not seek to be part of the mainstream world. That is why we should and must preserve the Human Rights Act and remain signed up to ECHR. It would, though, perhaps be remiss of me not to take the opportunity to have a sting in the tail to say that in championing the human rights, I do think it is important that the Scottish Government should take cognizance of both ECHR and the decisions of the European Court on the right of prisoners to vote. It would be no small step uh, to make sure that we got on the right side of the European courts. It's perhaps something that we should think about, as well as chastising the Tory government for their actions and as they propose to do. Malcolm Chisholm, followed by Margaret Mitch. Uh, presiding officer, I congratulate Christina McKelvey on bringing forward this important motion. I agree with what she said at the start of her speech about uh, refugees, but also more generally about the importance of the Human Rights Act in protecting fundamental liberties and holding power to account. Now, of course, the actual Human Rights Act was passed by the Labour government in 1998, and what it was seeking to do was to ensure that people who wanted to take a case previously to the Human Court of Human Rights could, from 1998 onwards, uh, take, their case, uh, take their case to the domestic court. So, obviously, the uh, UK government is seeking to abolish that aspect of ECHR, but my understanding is that they also want to have the right to veto ECHR more generally, and that, of course, would, would require them to actually uh, depart from ECHR, from the Council of Europe. Some people even argue from the EU, although I don't think that would necessarily uh, follow. Uh, I think the Conservatives also want to limit human rights coverage to the most serious cases and deny people human rights if they are not deemed to have made a positive contribution to the UK. So these are very significant changes. And although uh, I, I reminded people that it was the Labour government in 1998 that brought in the Human Rights Act, it was actually a Conservative government uh, in the early 1950s who was very, very keen on the ECHR. Churchill was keen on it. I think it was a Conservative MP, Maxwell Fife, who was very instrumental in the drawing up of the ECHR. So this is a new departure uh, for the Conservative Party to to be uh, challenging uh, fundamental rights in this way. And I know that there are uh, quite a few Conservative MPs in the UK Parliament who are not happy about this, and part of my grounds for optimism is that they may rebel. But, of course, my other ground for optimism is that uh, uh, we, I think, do... Uh, that, that, that abolishing uh, the Human Rights Act uh, does require uh, the consent of this Parliament. So I think we actually have a very important role to play in protecting... Uh, the Human Rights Act and ECHR more uh, generally. Now, it's made groundbreaking judgments on a wide range of issues helping the UK to become a more progressive society. And I think to those who criticise some of the judgments, we should emphasise how many of those judgments have actually helped some of the most vulnerable people in society, for example, protecting uh, older and disabled people who are receiving care. Uh, other examples are it has helped victims of rape sue the police for failing to act on their complaints and has also held social services to account for not doing enough to stop child abuse. So of course, it's not just the vulnerable uh, who are protected by it. It also helps to protect the freedom of the press, which I'm sure we all believe in, and has also, for example, defended the rights of servicemen and women to have uh, the right equipment when they are serving uh, uh, overseas. So I strongly support the am amnesty campaign launched in April, which urges people to do the human right thing and uh, protect uh, the Act. And the Amnesty campaign uses examples to highlight um, the very uh, real impact that the Human Rights Act has had. It also has a petition. I think it's got nearly 100,000 signatures. People can uh, add their names to that at www w.savetheact.uk. Uh, and I think it is powerful, the examples that Amnesty give 
in their um, campaign. I've given some general examples already, but I think it's really important to remind people who are critical of the Act exactly what it has meant in practice. For example, a woman with multiple sclerosis who was forced to spend all day every day in bed was able to use the Human Rights Act to get her local council to increase the amount of care she received. A second example that they gave an elderly couple who were placed in separate care homes after 65 years of marriage, they were able to use the Human Rights Act to successfully persuade their local authority to allow the, the woman to move into her husband's care home. I have other examples, but I can see my time is running out. We only need to glance abroad to the crisis, whether in Syria or Gaza or in other places, or look to the horror being faced by refugees on the shores of the EU to recognise just how precious our human rights are and how we must fight for them. We must fight for the human rights of others and we must face down any attempt to withdraw those rights in the UK. Margaret Mitchell, followed by Alice McKim. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This is not a new subject, having been covered in topical questions and other debates. However, I thank Christina McKelvey for tabling this motion and providing me with the opportunity to set the record straight regarding the UK Government's proposal to put the, Euro the European Convention of Human Rights into a British Bill of Rights. Britain has a, a proud tradition of upholding human rights and played a significant role in drafting the European Convention on Human Rights, which was enacted in 1953. This represented a historic and groundbreaking codification of the rights that all humans should expect to enjoy. In June uh, this year, the UK Government confirmed that it would bring forward proposals, including a public consultation on replacing the 1998 Human Rights Act with a British Bill of Rights. Since then, much political capital has been made about this proposal. So it's unfortunate that Amnesty International's campaign in seeking to ensure that the Human Rights Act is not repealed infers that British citizens will suddenly lose their right to life, right to education, right to marriage, liberty, property, and so the list goes on. This despite the acknowledgement from the then Justice Minister, Rosanna Cunningham, that the precise implications of the repeal of the Human Rights Act would depend on the detail of the repealing legislation. So let's be quite clear. By repealing the Human Rights Act, the UK Government is not proposing to abolish human rights. Instead, it is proposing to uphold them in a way that reflects the values of those living in the UK by ensuring the interpretation of, European, of the European Convention rights lies with UK judges. This addresses concerns over the so-called mission creep of the European Court. A recent case in point being the European Court's decision that life imprisonment for the most serious violent offenders should not be allowed on the basis that it amounts to inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment, regardless of the severity of the crime. Another example is the European Court's decision on the rights of prisoners to vote, already alluded to by uh, Kenny McCaskill. This was a decision that our now First Minister Nicola Sturgeon recognised as problematic when she disagreed and said, people who commit crimes and are sent to jail do not get to vote. I do not believe that a good case has been made for changing that situation. However, presiding officer, I consider it only fair to point out the irony of so much political capital being made about the supposed adverse effects of the proposed Bill of Rights when the Scottish Government has allowed potential human rights abuses to continue on its own watch on issues for which it has complete devolved competence. The so-called consensual stop and search by police in Scotland, where thousands of people, including children, have been searched without knowing they had a right to refuse, is evident of this infringement of human rights here. So, to put it in perspective, rather than raising this topic repeatedly when nothing further has happened since the initial announcement last year, the Scottish Government should instead concentrate on making sure the devolved issues over which it has competence are not the subject of the infringement of human rights here in Scotland. And I again thank the Member for bringing this debate and allowing me to set the record straight. 
Alice McInnes, followed by Rod Campbell. Thank you, President Officer. I congratulate Christina McKelvey for securing a debate on what is an important issue. While the UK Conservative government would have us believe that the Human Rights Act undermines the sovereignty of Parliament and the independence of our courts, and that it goes far beyond the UK obligations under the European Convention of Human Rights. They talk of the European Court of Human Rights being afflicted by mission creep, and they are determined to abolish the Act and propose replacing it, as we know, with a, Bill of British, a, Bill, a British Bill of Rights and Responsibilities. They have already admitted that the new Bill of Rights would only apply to the most serious cases. Which of our human rights are not serious? What's a trivial breach of human rights? And their plans go on to state that it would, and I quote, limit the reach of human rights cases to the UK so that British armed forces overseas are not subject to persistent human rights claims that undermine their ability to do their job and keep us safe. This would set a dangerous precedent, surely. Human rights are not something to opt in and opt out of. And as a Liberal Democrat, I firmly believe human rights are universal. In this week of all weeks, when David Cameron has been found so wanting in his government's response to the refugee crisis, why would anyone even contemplate allowing them to tamper with the hard-won freedoms set out in the Convention and in the Human Rights Act? Amnesty International's campaign, Do the Human Right Thing, focuses on saving the Act, and I strongly support their campaign and the work done by Amnesty International on this issue. The Human Rights Act compels us to comply with the European Convention on Human Rights, and let's not forget, as others have said, both of those documents were drafted by UK lawyers. Both are fully reflective of British values. They are not, as some might want us to believe, foreign diktat that allows criminals and terrorists to act with impunity, avoid punishment or exploit loopholes. On the contrary, it protects the most vulnerable in our society. It has helped keep families together by ensuring care homes and local authorities keep elderly married couples together protection of our uh, right to family life. It has helped to secure proper support from local authorities for those with a disability. It has protected the rights of LGBT people home and abroad. And it protects day in, day out the dignity of some of our most marginalised citizens. Furthermore, the scrapping of Human Rights Act, as others have said, would cause very specific legal issues relating to us sitting in devolved parliaments. The Act is hardwired into the devolution settlements here in Wales and in Northern Ireland. And the Good Friday Agreement was achieved in part thanks to the assurances provided by the Human Rights Act. The Conservatives have admitted that if their proposed Bill of Rights and Responsibilities was not accepted by the international community, the UK would be forced out of the Convention. So abolishing the Human Rights Act and leaving the Convention would put us in the same club as Belarus, often dubbed the last dictatorship of Europe. To walk away from the Human Rights Act and the Convention would undermine our ability for us to ask other countries to respect the rights of their citizens. It would send that damaging message that the UK does not respect their international obligations, so why should anyone else? It was only the presence of Liberal Democrats in the last UK government that prevented the Conservatives from abolishing the Human Rights Act earlier. Unfortunately, the Conservatives are now in a position to jeopardise these rights that we hold dear. I support this motion and Amnesty International's campaign and I will work with colleagues around the chamber to do the human right thing. As Amnesty has said, we can't let the UK government turn universal freedoms into privileges for a chosen few. Rod Campbell, followed by Elaine Murray. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to participate in this debate and I commend Christina McKelvey for bringing it to the chamber. As others have already indicated, it's perhaps hard to remember that in the late 1940s and early 50s, conservative politicians of the day were proponents of the European Convention of Human Rights. But they recognised the need to move forward in Europe and not to move backwards, even though in the case of David Maxwell Fife, who Malcolm Chisholm has already referred to, he would perhaps have been surprised at the extent to which the Convention has moved forward in relation to matters of sexual morality. But last autumn, Conservative plans to repeal the Human Rights Act and replace it with the British Bill of Rights were announced, together with a move to stop the UK courts having to take account of Strasbourg jurisprudence. Since the election in May, Conservatives have reiterated that commitment and we now seem to be moving on towards a consultation. But why are these proposals worrying? Because the Human Rights Act is the act that sets out the fundamental rights and freedoms that everyone in Scotland and in the UK has access to. These rights and freedoms are, of course, based on the Convention. 
And according to that Act, all public authorities must respect these rights and freedoms, including prisons, police officers and councils, an essential mechanism to protecting our rights and freedoms. Presiding Officer, Scotland has a long and rich tradition of upholding human rights and freedoms. Even the Scottish Government's recent commitment to accept a fair and proportionate number of refugees in Scotland in the wake of the European refugee crisis is a fine example of that commitment to those who have no rights in their own countries. Furthermore, the Human Rights Act is, of course, at the heart of Scottish legislation. Any withdrawal from the Act under the Civil Convention may have implications for the devolved settlement. The Conservative Party, as we know, has only one MP in Scotland, only one representative out of 59 committed to these proposals. I urge the Conservatives to think carefully about the wider implications of this move. They simply have no mandate to tamper with Scotland's long and rich commitment to human rights. And I'm sure my SNP colleagues and indeed Liberal and Labour representatives at Westminster and at Holyrood will continue to oppose Tory proposals to repeal the Human Rights Act. Furthermore, it's quite indicative that several charity organisations and groups, including the SCVO and the Health and Social Care Alliance, have highlighted their concerns about the potential risks associated with repealing the Act. Even those in David Cameron's own party have voiced opposition to the UK Government's plans to repeal the Act, including, of course, David Davis and Ken Clark, among others. For all the talk of bad decisions on prisoners' right to vote, with both Westminster and the Scottish Parliament's taking the view that prisoners should not have the right to vote, when it came to it in February this year, at the court, the disappointment of some lawyers, no doubt, the European Court decided that UK prisoners barred from voting were not entitled to compensation. <laughs> Presiding officer, my suspicion is that a British Bill of Rights will be equal to an English Bill of Rights, which would fail to take into account the needs and interests of the people of Scotland. Indeed, in the Conservative proposals published in October, apart from a small reference to the claim of right of 1689, you could be forgiven for thinking that Scotland did not exist at all. I think we are right to be fearful of a British Bill of Rights, particularly in relation to social rights, and I think we can be certain that it will severely curtail anything which might look to be a right to economic assistance, to housing or welfare. Presiding officer, I'd like to conclude by referring to the possible constitutional crisis the Tory proposals will cause, because in the views of some commentators, um, Michael pinto Jaczynski, um, Scotland and the UK risk being forced out of the Convention altogether. In his view, you can't leave, can't leave the jurisdiction of the court without also rejecting the Convention. And there's also a problem in the view of a commentator, Professor Fran Francesca Clug, in terms of the UK's continued membership of the European the Union. In her view, uh, you can't, adhere, you can't uh, adhere to the Convention and... Uh, uh, you need to adhere to the Convention to be a member of the European Union. No doubt for Tory Eurosceptics that's grand, but for more considered voices, uh, I would suggest don't do it. Aline Murray, followed by John Finney. Thank you, Presiding uh, Officer. And can I also congratulate Christina McKelvey on securing this debate? It's a very appropriate topic for debate because the human rights of millions of people in Syria and across the Middle East and North Africa are threatened to the extent that they have had to flee their countries of origin and seek asylum elsewhere. And of course there has been an outpouring of human humanitarian response in Europe to the horrific experiences of our fellow human beings. And while we compare our situations to theirs, it, it is also well, worth reflecting on how the European Convention on Human Rights, drafted way back in 1950 in the aftermath of the Second World War, protects those of us fortunate enough to live in Council of Europe member states from the atrocities which others suffer. As a Scottish Labour member, I am proud that it was one of the first actions of the incoming Labour government in 1997 to incorporate ECHR into domestic law. I am pleased, therefore, to fully endorse an Amnesty International's campaign, Do the Human Right Thing, raising awareness of the importance of the Act and the threat currently proposed by, posed by the UK government's intention to repeal it and replace it with a so-called British Bill of Rights, and it's a Bill of Rights, not a Bill of Human Rights, which is, is proposed. Professor Alan Miller, Chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, warned in October last year that, quote, human rights laws have often benefited us in ways we do not always realise. Here in the UK, they have been used to expose fatal failures in hospitals and care homes and to challenge the unfair impact of the bedroom tax. From protecting soldiers in battle to challenging prison conditions that have no place in a decent society, the Human Rights Act and the European Convention on Human Rights provides a safety net for everyone. Why, therefore, would the UK Government wish to remove that safety net and risk expulsion from the European Convention? 
A clue to that is the way in which the original announcement by Chris Grayling, Justice Secretary at the time, was greeted by delighted headlines and right-wing tabloids trumpeting so-called British values and removing the authority of meddling European judges. Those same publications had for years reported human rights as only benefiting, in their view, bad people, such as offenders and others they considered to be undesirables. Theresa May herself contributed to this in 2011 by her unfounded so story at her conference about an illegal immigrant being allowed to stay in the country because he had a cat. Like organisations such as H uh, SCHR, uh, the Amnesty International campaign presents the other important side of the argument. Malcolm Chisholm has already referred to the vulnerable elderly couple who would have been separated when he was admitted to care home because uh, he, she didn't fit the criteria for that home. Their human rights to family life have now been respected. The woman fleeing domestic violence with her children, accused of making her children intentionally homeless and threatened with the removal of those children, a family now rehoused because their human rights were, were recognised. Rape victims no longer subjected to cross-examination by their attackers. The journalist who appealed to the European Court and permitted not to reveal his source on the takeover of a company in order that the information he had obtained from that source could be provided in the public interest. Yes, human rights approach can force us to focus on issues which are controversial. We discussed one, the age of criminal responsibility, at the Justice Committee this morning. Issues such as the rights of prisoners to vote or the physical punishment of children can provoke instinctive responses. ECHR and the Human Rights Act have forced us to consider the difficult issues more deeply and more thoughtfully. Repeal of the Human Rights Act would be a deeply retrograde step, and I wish the Amnesty International every success in its campaign to make the Conservative Government think again. John Finney, followed by Christian Allard. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I also congrat congratulate Christina McKelvey for a timely debate, but then I always think it is timely to discuss human rights. I would th like to thank everyone for the briefings and declare my membership of uh, Amnesty and indicate my support for the uh, Do the Right Thing campaign. I think I alluded before to a, a meeting I, I attended of the Highland Senior Citizens Network as part of the SNAP process, where they were being, as part of civil society, being consulted on, on how we should go about dealing with our human rights there and embedding them. And the, the chair, um, a, a very respected individual, acknowledged that he had no previous experience of human rights. In fact, many of the people there wonder about the, the relevance to them. But as it became apparent due to their very positive work in relation to the quality of care that was provided with care homes, the dignity of residents, issues like hydration, mobility, bed sores, medication, privacy, they really fully understood the need for a rights-based approach. So that's in line with what Amnesty told us in their briefing that the Human Rights Act is for the most vulnerable, but they also said it guarantees important rights for everyone living in the UK. And I think relevance is the key to this. Um, we're having this debate because of an erosion of respect for individuals. That's been part of a concerted campaign, I would say a neoliberal campaign. Indeed, mission creep is how I would describe it. Um, and that's reflected in policies which attack the poor and the vulnerable, undermine hard for, for uh, uh, workplace terms and conditions, and brought about a, a discussion about deserving recipients of public support. Well, everyone's deserving of the protection of human rights, I would say. And of course we have, and I again make no apology for repeating, a UK Prime Minister who talked about slaying the health and safety mon monster. The highest levels of cleanliness must apply in their hospitals, and I speak as a proud son of a, a, a hospital cleaner. And it's about, that is about the dignity of patients, that is about their well-being, that is fundamental rights, that's their human rights, and that is health and safety. And if we make these links to practical things, I think um, it makes sense to the debate to a lot of people. Um, the Human Rights Act has consistently proved its value by providing an essential safeguard in areas such as protecting older and disabled people who are receiving care. And we've heard that consistently, it was one of the briefings, heard that consistently throughout the, the, the debate here. And can I commend the Equality and Human Rights Commission for not just for their work, but for their very, very diplomatic um, phraseology they used in relation to to uh, the, the, the situation we find ourselves in, where they said, and I quote, Scotland's devolution settlement is directly tied to the uh, human Rights Act and ECHR. Any change to our human rights framework would have to take careful account of the implications for the UK's wider constitutional architecture. 
Now, I'm someone who seeks an independent Scotland, but I'm not going to revel in the, uh, the, uh, the, to highlight the difference here. I want the highest standards to apply across these islands, regardless of our constitutional arrangements. And I would like one very clear message to come from this debate, that that's what everyone wants, uh, not just within these islands, but beyond. So I commend the work of the UK's three national human rights institutions working together to pursue that. Uh, there was a time when the UK was admired as a place of sanctuary, and I have to say that that reputation has been sullied of late. I want to see us not being complacent. There is no need to be complacent in Scotland about issues like gypsy travellers, stop and search, as has been alluded to, or votes, as has been alluded to. The UK has an opportunity to show it has a heart and a heart that has regard for human rights, and I hope that they take that approach um, and do the right thing with regard to this debate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Finney. Christian Allard. Thank you, President Officer. And I would like uh, to add my thanks to uh, Christina McKelvey uh, regarding uh, taking this uh, debate to the Chamber today. I think it's very, very important. And like uh, John Finney just said, it, I think it's very timely. It's very timely. Why? Uh, I, I, maybe Margaret Mitchell maybe doesn't know about it, but uh, the Tory plans to scrap the Human Rights Act was confirmed in Parliament today, and the uh, consultation will come forward. I think it comes from the uh, Justice uh, Minister, uh, the Conservative Justice uh, Minister, Mr. Rabb, who said uh, that the bill will give the UK Supreme Court supremacy of the European Court of Human Rights and give a greater respect to the legislative role for honourable members in this place, being the place at Westminster. So it's very timely and it's very important that we have the, the debate today. And again, I thank Christian McKelvey to, to bring in there. And I look forward to have a, a lot more debates about it because I think, presenting officer, it's very, very important that uh, we uh, talk about human rights in different in terms that the Conservatives are, talk, uh, are talking about. John Finney talked about uh, a, new, a neoliberal campaign. Uh, he might be right. I, I think that uh, um, Mr. Schultzism talked about as well uh, about the, the many Conservatives in the past who were very much guardians of our human rights. Uh, I don't think the Conservatives today are very much in the same kind of vein or the same kind of, 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 of place that uh, uh, the predecessors were. Uh, to a certain extent, I think we are in a different place altogether, and we're a different place on the language used, and it's so, so important. I think Christina McKelvey started, presenting officer, with uh, talking about the refugee uh, crisis that we have just now, and we can see our language is so important uh, in a debate as important as human rights, and we want to focus on that language and making sure that we've got more and more debates about it and that politicians have a responsibility, so as the media, to make sure that we talk about a positive language when we talk about human rights. Human rights are things, are good things for the people of Britain, just like they are for uh, everybody who lives in Britain or live outside Britain, because we are not British rights or, or labor rights, even if uh, labor introduced the, the Human Rights Act 1998. We are everybody's right. We are human rights, and it's very important that that remember that particular point. Uh, and the key, the key evidence, uh, as I said, with the refugee crisis and the conversation we are having human rights is the use of language. And there are a few examples in that conservative proposal for changing Britain's human rights laws, which uh, we, 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 we have uh, found here. And a lot of it is really language that shouldn't be used. For example, uh, twice uh, the language is talking about um, uh, Brit uh, Britain first. We must put Britain first. In the context of, of refugees, uh, like we have just now a refugee crisis, or the context of human rights, that's the last thing we should do. We should put human first. Everybody, wherever they come from, where, where, wherever they live. And Margaret Mitchell talked about uh, some of uh, offenders who, 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 and, and the relation to it. What she forgot to say, she didn't use the exact quote. On the quote, he said, uh, they are foreign nationals. And, and that idea to mix foreign national, foreign national in a human rights debate with uh, one of the most uh, 
very uh, uh, crimes, most uh, evil crime that you'll find. In a debate on human rights, it's absolutely not the right thing to do. And I think if the Conservatives have got a plan for change, this is not how uh, we, sh we should debate it. So again, I will, I will remind the Chamber that we all have a responsibility to have when uh, with human rights uh, on the language that we use. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. Uh, now I call Marco Biagi to find the debate minister. No more than seven minutes. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. It's fair to say very few members' debates attract the level of interest we've had this evening, but it is very rare that there is a question mark hanging over fundamental rights, and everybody who has attended deserves credit, starting, of course, with Christina McKelvey, who has brought the subject to the Chamber. But I also want to congratulate Amnesty International on the campaign that it has launched today. That campaign, let me be clear, has our support. But Amnesty International is a very well-chosen name for an organisation. I want to draw attention to the international part of that, because the UK government has promised to bring forward proposals for a British Bill of Rights. The desire to remove the word human is no accident and is much more than a cosmetic change, because it signals a desire to move away from a universal standard, a separation from a human rights framework that is meant to connect and unite people around the world regardless of their circumstances. And let's make no mistake, reducing the human rights safeguards we currently have would threaten the fundamental freedoms of us all, but undoubtedly the most vulnerable members of society who are always hardest hit. To quote John Wadham, the former director of Liberty, a simplistic version of democracy where Parliament rules and Parliament rules alone is not adequate to protect our democratic values. The Bill of Rights we have is the Human Rights Act and the Bill of Rights we need is the Human Rights Act. And as a result of this desire to move away from the existing terms, it's no surprise that the eyes of the world are on us. There has been contribution focusing on the critical protections provided by ECA. HR and HRA, but let's not forget the wider framework, seven core UN human rights treaties and eight that we have signed up to under the Council of Europe treaty system. The UK was recently examined by the UN Human Rights Committee in relation to its obligations under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, a treaty which in itself echoes many of the key protections found in ECHR. Members won't be surprised that the committee's concluding observations expressed concern in the UN, as there is also in the Council of Europe, at the prospect of the UK retreating from its commitment to human rights and fundamental freedoms. That concern is widespread. Alby Sachs, a South African lawyer and judge, said, if you did a paternity test, you would find the UK's genes are there in the ECHR's conception. The threat to withdraw would be like daddy leaving home. The country that was amongst the founders of the European Convention and the ECHR could become the dismantler of the entire enterprise. And ask ourselves, what message does it send when we wish to provide international leadership on the importance of complying with human rights if we are withdrawing from what is seen as a more international standard? The Irish government has highlighted the dimension that affects them, stating that protecting the human rights aspects of the Good Friday agreements are a shared responsibility between the two governments. That is an unusual intervention, but it also reflects some of the constitutional issues that the proposals throw up within the United Kingdom. Under the Scotland Act, the power to observe and implement international obligations, including obligations under the ECHR, falls firmly within the competence of this Parliament. And like the wider work of this Parliament, that power and those obligations are of immense importance. The Sewell Convention exists to ensure that there is some constitutional underpinning of the rights of this Parliament, that the powers of this Parliament will not be changed without the permission of this Parliament. But that Sewell Convention is bounded only by the UK Government's willingness to exercise restraint in using the sovereignty that the Scotland Act 1998 reserves to them. Could there be a more apt illustration of where rights beyond the untrammeled will of Parliament are needed and necessary? And there are some very real dangers here. Margaret Mitchell has highlighted uh, the proposals, but I would just say that if we are having a British Bill of Rights, if it is the same as ECHR, 
Why bother? If it is different to ECHR, I think it's safe to assume that this government won't mean that the different means stronger, especially when there are the accusations of mission creep and where there are the doubts, as Rod Campbell have highlighted, about commitments to social rights. And we've heard repeatedly today about the desire to reduce the accessibility of recourse to those rights. Underlying the Conservative proposals, I think, is the complaint that sometimes courts in the UK or in Strasbourg deliver judgments that the government of the day doesn't like. Well, the rule of law means that governments can't simply pick and choose which court ruling should be allowed to stand. Courts making decisions with which we disagree is not an excuse to get rid of the court system. And there are a lot of myths in the wider debate. Let me try and scotch a few of them. In 2014, the court dealt with 1,997 applications concerning the UK and a violation of convention rights was found in only 0.7% of cases. In fact, the UK had the highest number of judgments finding no violation. Malcolm Chisholm and Alison McInnes and others have highlighted some of the positive examples, the positive examples that we need to hear more about. The victims of rape that can expect now to see their complaints investigated, people serving in the army who can expect to receive equipment and training to an appropriate standard, children suffering mistreatment or neglect that can expect social services to respond to warning signs, journalists who aren't required to disclose their sources, disabled people, including people with mental health problems and care or detention who can expect to receive treatment and conditions to meet their specific needs. Victims of uh, LGBTI people who have used human rights to overcome discrimination and indeed that elderly couple who after 65 years of marriage were going to be forced to live apart due to their differing care needs and used the Human Rights Act and Article 8, the right to family life, to ensure that the council backed down. With every day that passes, I think the UK government is showing more and more that its all-consuming obsessions are shrinking the state and an instinctive aversion to almost anything with the word European in its title. Those aren't my values. They're not this government's values. They're not this parliament's values. In fact, I don't think they deserve the word values at all. Values are what are in the ECHR. Scotland will stand for those. Scotland will do the human right thing. And I sincerely hope that the UK sees sense and follows suit. Thank you, Minister. That ends uh, Member's business for this evening. I now close this meeting.